really made President Kennedy and the Attorney General mad. Um, and later we were beaten and left bloody. And people were scattered in different parts of the city of Montgomery. Dr. King and Reverend Abernathy was in Chicago on a speaking assignment. They heard about what happened. They flew from Atlanta, flew from Chicago to Atlanta. Then they came to Montgomery, met with a group of us, and started organizing a mass meeting for that Sunday. And the mass meeting was supposed to start at 7 p.m. at the First Baptist Church, the same church where I had met Dr. King and Reverend Abernathy before. Um, by 4 o'clock, the church was completely full. And later that evening, he was trying to burn the church, do state bombs in. They saw burning cars on the lawn of the church. And Dr. King went down into the basement of the church, made a call to President uh, to Bobby Kennedy, and said, we have a very dangerous situation here, and the President needs to do something, he needs to act. President Kennedy made a decision to federalize the Alabama National Guard, call out the United States Marshal, and place the city of Montgomery under martial law. If it hadn't been for the action of President Kennedy, and uh, that evening, well, I think a lot of people probably lost their lives that evening. It was very, very dangerous. The general that took over the meeting that night uh, came in and said no one could leave. And we stayed in the church to the wee hours of the morning. And we all, all of the Freedom Riders, along with Dr. King and Reverend Abernathy, which, uh, we were transported to the home of a very successful businessman. And this man had been in Tuskegee, Africa. He was a pharmacist. Um, a guy at the downtown pharmacy. Right. That was a dispatch. His pharmacy was a dispatch point for the Montgomery bus boycott. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dean Harris. Yeah. And so you continue on from Montgomery to New Orleans. To, to, to Jackson. To Jackson, I'm sorry. What happened in Jackson? Well, uh, the Alabama National Guard led us to the Mississippi state line. That was members of the National Guard, military people with their guns drawn on the bus, in front of the bus, behind the bus, and they get to the Mississippi state line. Then the Mississippi National Guard with their guns, their rifles, met us there, and they drove us to uh, the city of Jackson, to the Greyhound bus station there. And you get to Jackson, um, you go into the station to test the restroom facility or the waiting room or the lunch counter or whatever, there's a captain. Captain Ray. Captain Ray, I never knew his, only thing I ever knew was Ray. Yeah. Captain Ray. And Captain Ray said, move on. And in the same breath, he said, under arrest. But you're trying to move on. And uh, uh, during that summer, uh, more than 300 people came through Jackson and was arrested. We filled the city jail, later the county jail, and took some of us out to the farm. And C.T. Vivian was at the farm. He said something to one of the guard. They hit him. He was hit. And uh, blood appeared. And I don't think they liked that. So they made a decision that they didn't have enough room in uh, the city jail or the farm or uh, the county jail. One morning, they put us all in a big van and took us down to Parchment. And the Parchment, I you know, heard about Parchment, read about Parchment. And I didn't know what to expect. So we get down to Parchment, and I hate to use this language, but we get down to Parchment. Uh, we go to, they took, took us to the maximum security area. And this guy said, Senor GD, free, freedom slums now. So we have niggers here. They would beat you up or eat you up. We didn't know what was going to happen. So, they brought, all, brought us all in in this hallway. Uh, all of the men, black and white men, and they ordered us to strip naked. So you take all your clothes off and you're just standing there. Uh, it, was, it was so dehumanizing. And then they ordered you to take showers in two. So while you're taking your shower, you don't have anything on, nothing. So while you're taking your shower, they have a gun pointed on you. And if you have a mustache, uh, any facial hair, beard, or whatever, 
You have to shave it off. There's no mirror. You just have to shave it, cutting yourself, doing whatever. And after the shower and removing the facial hair, they um, um, bring you back to a cell and then give you a pair of Mississippi State Penitentiary shorts and an undershirt. And that's what we kept on. And I think we probably changed once a week. And maybe that's one shower a week. And most of us tried to get out within 40 days so we could appeal our cases. But one Sunday afternoon, I remember, Ross Barnett, who was the governor at the time, came by with a, a group of people uh, to see us. <laughs> and it was really strange. It's like we were some unusual creatures from another <laughs> land. Did you speak to him? I didn't say anything. Uh, we got so much to cover, and, and uh, the evening is, is getting late. But let me take you one other place after Parchman and the Freedom Rides in 1961. And you're involved in movement activity all the time from that day until uh, where I want to go right now, and that's Freedom Summer 1964. Tell us about Freedom Summer and, and the role you played in it and, and how that developed. Well, Freedom Summer. Uh, in the gym, we uh, I had spoken at the March on Washington. And oh, let me ask you about Washington now. <laughs> the March on Washington in August of 1963, and it's sponsored by the civil rights organizations and other groups and individuals, and you are one of the speakers, and the rule for the speakers was that each one of them had to turn a copy of their speech in the day before, ostensibly so copies could be made for the news media, but in reality, so they could be checked to see if they were acceptable or not. And your speech was not acceptable. Why was your speech not acceptable? Well, I think there's certain uh, words and phrases that people thought it was not in keeping with the, uh, the rule of the day. It was not, uh, it was, well, it was not in tune uh, with the climate, with the political environment. Uh, you know, the original text says something like, in good conscience, we cannot uh, support the proposed civil rights bill of the administration. It was too little and it was too late. It says something like, there was not anything in this bill to protect old women and young children involved in peaceful nonviolent protests uh, run down by policemen on horseback and chased by police dogs. And you know, President Kennedy took the position, if a person had a sixth grade education, he should be considered literate and should be able to register to vote. We and SNCC took the position that uh, the only qualification for being able to register to vote should be that of age and residence. Now, I was working on this speech, you may recall, uh, we have seen a group of women, photographs of women in the New York Times, in Southern Africa, carrying signs saying, one man, one vote. So we said in that speech, one man, one vote is the African cry, it is ours too, it must be ours. Then another part of the speech, we said something like, you tell us to wait, you tell us to be patient. We cannot wait, we cannot be patient, we want our freedom and we want it now. And then we went on and said, listen, listen, Mr. Kennedy, listen, members of the Congress, but what really got people more than anything else, near the end of the speech, as you may recall, I said something like, if we do not see meaningful progress here today, the day may come when we will not confine our marching on Washington, but we may be forced to march to the South the way Sherman did, nonviolently. <laughs> and people say that was a little too much. <laughs> uh, the Archbishop, uh, uh, Archbishop of Wall, uh, who was Archbishop of the Washington Diocese, who was supposed to get an invocation, threatened to give an invocation. And people felt that maybe there was some other forces behind him. And especially Mr. Randolph and Dr. King and Mr. Wilkin and others said, Mr. Randolph once said, John, we come this far together, let's stay together, can't make these changes. I remember Dr. King said, John, it doesn't sound like you or something like that. But anyway, I can say no to Ethel Randolph from one of the So we made the changes. So rather than talking about Sherman, we made reference to marching through certain cities. And, uh, well, let's move back to the uh, Freedom Summer. Tell, tell us about how Freedom Summer 